I posted a video recently about the Trinity, and I traced multiple texts throughout the Old Testament and through the New Testament, which demonstrate why in early rabbinic thought as well as early Christian thought, God was thought of as having a single nature, yet multiple persons. Now, I want to quote a couple of the early church fathers and early church theologians just to demonstrate that there's a continuity between these early biblical texts as well as the early church, and that this belief of Trinitarian monotheism very quickly became mainstream. We'll start with the Didache. Having first rehearsed all these things, baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So this is describing an early baptismal formula. Notice the singular name, yet it lists three names. Kind of sounds like Trinitarian monotheism. For in the name of God, the Father, and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. That's from Justin. 100 to 165 AD. And then you have Ignatius, prosper both in faith and love, in the Son, in the Father, and in the Spirit, harmony of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, and His Spirit. Ignatius lived from 35 to 108 AD. That's from the letter to the Magnesians as well as the Philadelphians. And these are among Ignatius' authentic letters, quoted later by Eusebius and Jerome. From Polycarp, I praise thee, I bless thee, I glorify thee through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, and the Spirit. Tertullian said, Unity is distributed in a trinity, placed in order. The three are the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So this concept of Trinitarian monotheism took off extremely early in Christianity, right from the New Testament and Old Testament texts themselves, and they continue throughout the early church. So you have this sort of mainstream highway of Trinitarian monotheism, but then when you come to the Quran, you have an island over here. And the Quran, in its polemic against the concept of three in one, is apparently addressing a very small group of Byzantines. Surat Razul Allah, Muhammad's earliest existing biography, gives the background to Surah 4 and Surah 5 in the Quran, which is the polemic against what Muslims want to call the Trinity. There were Christians, according to the Byzantine rite, this is page 271, by the way, Surat Razul Allah. There were Christians according to the Byzantine rite, though they differed among themselves in some points, etc. They argue that he is God, that's Jesus. So they argue that Jesus is God because he used to raise the dead, and heal the sick, and declare the unseen, and make clay birds, and then breathe into them so that they flew away. They argue that he is the Son of God, and that they say he had no known father, and he spoke in the cradle. And this is something that no child of Adam has ever done. They argue that he is the third of three and that God says, We have done, we have commanded, we have created, and we have decreed. And they say, If he were one, he would have said, I have done, I have created, and soon. But he is he, and Jesus and Mary. Concerning all these assertions, the Quran came down. And this is why it is inappropriate for Muslims to use Surah 4 and Surah 5 in the Quran to argue against mainstream Christian Trinitarian monotheism. It is inappropriate because what the Quran is addressing is what a very small sect of Byzantine Jew, uh, Christians apparently believed, and that is that it was not the it was not God, the Son, and the Spirit, or not even God, the Son, the Spirit, and Mary, but it was God, the Son, and Mary. Right, that was their conception of the Trinity. No idea where these Christians came from or where they went. They apparently popped into existence and disappeared without a trace, but that's what the text says. So I'll just, I'll just take it on its own terms. Now, Muslims should not want to take Surah 4, 171 or Surah 5, 116 in the Quran as addressing Christian Trinitarian monotheism as a whole. This would be a very bad idea because it shows a very bad understanding of Christian doctrine, and Allah surely would actually understand what Christian doctrine teaches, and so Allah can't make a mistake, and so you want to, as a Muslim, you want to keep this scope of what Surah 4 and what Surah 5 are saying as being very small, very narrow. You want to keep it exactly where Ibn Ashaq puts it, and that is on a very small sect of Byzantine Christians. So you cannot use the Quran as a Muslim to argue against mainstream Christian Trinitarian monotheism that's been around for about 2,000 years. Here are a couple of reasons why. When you compare Trinitarian monotheism to Unitarian monotheism that's in the Quran, you come up with two basic 
modifications. One modification would be the deity of Jesus, and the second would be the inclusion of the Spirit to the exclusion of Mary, okay? So here, here's the problem. The deity of Jesus, okay? The Quran is written to address, again, this Byzantine sect, and they argue about the deity of Jesus based on these things. He used to raise the dead. Okay, that argument doesn't come from the biblical text. There's no doctrine in the New Testament that, that says, because Jesus raised the dead, he's God. Okay, so this is not an argument from the biblical text. And heal the sick. Again, this is not an argument from the biblical text. The Bible nowhere says, because Jesus healed the sick, he's God. Okay? Declare the unseen. Well, that's just what prophets do. And again, this is not a biblical argument for the divinity of Jesus. Make clay birds. Well, that's not even in the Bible. All right? This is one of those things from the Quran that comes from Gnostic sources or the infancy Arabic gospel or whatever happened to be floating around 7th century Arabia at the time. They argue that he is the son of God, and that he had no father, and that he spoke in the cradle. Again, show me one Christian today who argues that Jesus was divine because he spoke in the cradle. No. You show me that, and I'll show you a Muslim who argues that uh, Jibreel is divine. Right? It just doesn't exist. Um, they argue that he's the third of three, and that God says, We have done, we have commanded, we have created. I'm sorry, but that is Quranic language. That is the so-called royal we in the Quran, okay? Which has no precedence that I know of in any 7th century Arabic literature. It just sort of, again, pops out of nowhere into the Quran and then disappears, never to be seen again. Concerning all these assertions, the Quran came down. Here's what I'm saying. The arguments in the Quran, then, against the divinity of Jesus are not sophisticated enough to deal with with arguments from the biblical text, which, ironically, predate the Quran by hundreds of years. Okay, Arguments for the divinity of Jesus come from things like Mark. Yes, the Gospel of Mark. The so-called low Christology in the Gospel of Mark by Shabir Ali. Yeah, right. That's why Mark equates Jesus' arrival in first century Palestine with the return of Yahweh to his temple in Malachi 3 or Isaiah 40. That's why Mark presents Jesus as the one who will dispense the Spirit of God in the 8th verse of chapter 1. That's why Mark records Jesus' words before Caiaphas, claiming the divine motif attributed to Yahweh as the cloud rider. Yahweh has his throne in the clouds. No, that's Jesus. And it makes Caiaphas extremely angry, right? These are the types of arguments that, surprise, surprise, come from the Old Testament. That display, that demonstrate the divinity of Jesus. Okay, Arguments about the divinity of Jesus do not come from things like Jesus making clay birds and Jesus speaking from the cradle. No, we don't need the Arabic infancy gospel to demonstrate the divinity of Jesus. They come from the biblical texts. Thank you very much. What about the concept of three, this, this importing of the Holy Spirit into the, the single nature of God and having the Father, Son, and the Spirit, three persons in one single nature. You know, what does the Quran have to say about this? Again, an extremely simplistic argument from Surat Anisa. Say not three, God is one. Okay, in order to defeat this argument, all one has to do is entertain the concept that the nature of God does not fit into that it does not fit neatly, it is not confined to preschool-level mathematics. The concept of the nature of God is not confined to the arithmetic that a four- or five-year-old can perform. There are all sorts of attributes of God that are like this. The concept of God's knowledge does not fit neatly into what a master's course in philosophy or epistemology would say. It just doesn't. Thinking about God, as I note in my previous video, in human terms sometimes results in a paradox. And so Muslims on so many things will proclaim the, the incomprehensibility of Allah. We, we cannot comprehend Allah. He is transcendent. But then they pretend to know the nature of Allah, that He is one, and He can't be three in one somehow. Now, Christian 
Trinitarian monotheism gives God a little bit more credit than that. Christian Trinitarian monotheism says, you know what? Maybe God is a little bit beyond preschool arithmetic. Maybe this whole 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1 doesn't actually work. Maybe that's not a very good defeater for the concept of the nature of God. Okay, so arguments from the biblical texts for the divinity of Jesus go way beyond what the Quran was meant to address. And arguments about the triune yet single nature of God go way beyond what Surah 4, 171 was meant to address. If Muslims want to argue against the deity of Christ, if Muslims want to argue against Trinitarian monotheism, they have to do it from outside of the Quran. You have to do it from the biblical text itself. You have to see what the Bible actually says. And to Muslims who want to do that, to Muslims who want to investigate what the biblical text actually says on its own terms, I say to you, welcome. Let's explore what the Bible has to say about these issues. Thanks for watching.